Shalom, my friends. Welcome to our study on Second Thessalonians. That's Second Thessalonians. Pretty short book, and it ought to be fairly fast going through chapters one and three. But when we get to chapter two, boy, there's a lot to cover. So uh, we'll see how it goes. Uh, I may break this up into two, two videos. Anyway, let's dig right in. Chapter 1, 2 Thessalonians. Shaul, that's who we commonly know as Paul. And Sila and Timotheos to the assembly of the Thessalonians in Yahweh our Father and the Adon Yahshua HaMashiach. Favor to you. Other English versions say grace to you. The Aramaic Hebrew would be chana to you. May you pitch your tent with Elohim. May Elohim pitch his tent with you. Uh, I've been getting a lot of people asking me, uh, how do you pitch your tent with Elohim? And I'm not surprised because of the Western mindset that goes on in all of us today. Pitching a tent was something that the Hebrews did every day. It's kind of like uh, setting up your house. So they understood this word chana very well, because it was something they did every day. Well, you know, set your house up with Elohim and pray and ask him to set his house up with you. Pitch your tent with Elohim. Pray and ask him to pitch his tent with you. Now, the reason why so many people are asking me, how do I pitch my tent with Elohim? Is because the Western mindset is such that in order to do any particular thing, you have to first educate yourself on it. How do you do this particular thing? You can't do it until you learn how to do it. That's the Western mindset. The Eastern mindset, the mind of Yahshua, says that you learn how to do something by doing it. The education comes through the action. But we, in, with our Western mindset, we think you, you learn how to do something, you have to study it. You can't attempt doing it until you learn all the techniques and all the different ways of doing it. Then you can attempt it. Do yourself a favor, my friends. Try to adopt this attitude that if you want to learn how to do something, you learn by doing it. You know, I... Some of you may know I drive a 1954 Chevrolet pickup truck. It's a street rod with a lot of modern things, you know. It has a Chevy 350 engine in it, like, you know, from the 70s technologies, and I put air conditioning in it and so on. My point here is I took seats out of another car, stripped them down, and reupholstered them used the uh, material that I took off of the seats as patterns for sewing, got myself some buffalo hides. Uh, people in the car industry, when they recover seats, they don't use hides. They use, you know, commercial leathers. They're, they're thin. They're more like, you know, cotton. But these buffalo hides I got are, they're like a sixteenth of an inch thick. <laughs> these are animal skins from the buffalo. I never upholstered a seat before. I didn't do anything to educate myself on how to do it. This was the first time I bought an industrial sewing machine that is capable of stitching through this stuff. And I've gotten into the habit since I was a little boy 
If you've read my book, you'll understand that Elohim speaks to me through the Ruach, and I've learned how to listen. And so when I want to do something, I don't even think about educating myself first. I just jump in and start doing it, and as I go along, I ask the Ruach, you know what, how am I going to achieve this? Get that done, and then the next step is like, oh, how, I want, how would I do this? And I'm telling you, the Ruach, he gives me instructions that he'll reveal all truth to us. There's no joke about that scripture, my friends. So um, try and adopt this attitude. If there's something you want to do, don't think that you have to learn how to do it before you do it. Just do it and you'll learn. And, you know, if you screw up, that's okay. That's how you learn. <laughs> anyway, we didn't even get through the first sentence. And here I am going on about that word, Chana, pitch your tent with Elohim. So, you know, he says uh, to the Thessalonians, oh, I did get through the first. We're on verse 2. Chana to you. May you pitch your tent with Elohim. May he pitch his tent with you. And shalom from Yahweh, our Father. Shalom, I've covered this before. It's like, people think it means peace or, you know, hello, you know. It means absolute, complete, beracha, blessing on you physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, financially, in every way, shape, and form you can imagine from the Father, Yahuwah, and the Adon, Yeshua HaMashiach. Verse 3, we ought to give thanks to Elohim always for you, believers, as it is proper, because your belief grows exceedingly, and the love every one of you has for each other is increasing so that we ourselves boast of you among the assemblies of Elohim for your endurance and belief in all your persecutions and afflictions which you are bearing, clear evidence of the righteous judgment of Elohim in order for you to be counted worthy of the reign of Elohim, of the Malchut of Elohim, of the kingdom of Elohim, for which you also suffer since Elohim shall rightly repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to give you who are afflicted rest with us when the Adon Yahshua is revealed from the Shamayim with his mighty messengers in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know Elohim and on those who do not obey the good news of our Adon Yeshua HaMashiach, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Adon and from the esteem of his strength when he comes to be esteemed in his Kodeshim and to be admired among all those who believe in that day, capital D, because our witness to you was believed, period. <laughs> There's another one of Shaul's rambling sentences. He goes on and on before he, we come up with a period because he's so fervent and he's so strong in his convictions and in his delivery of understanding. Let's take a note of verse 10. When, when Yeshua comes to be esteemed in his Kodeshim, you remember the word Kodeshim? The dedicated ones, those who are dedicated to Elohim and to nothing else, those who make Elohim number one on a list of one, Yeshua, when he comes, verse 10, he will be esteemed in his Kodeshim, in those who love him that much. Verse 11, to this end, we always pray for you that our Elohim would count you worthy of this calling and complete all the good pleasure of goodness and the work of belief with power so that the name of our Adon, Yahshua HaMashiach, is esteemed in you and you in him according to the favor of our Elohim, according to the pitching of tents 
with our Elohim, and the Adon Yahshua HaMashiach. And I submit to you, my friends, that the name of our Adon, Yeshua HaMashiach, the name to be esteemed, is the name of the Father, Yahuwah, the name of the Father. And the Father gave his name to Yeshua. The name above all names we see in the first covenant is Yahuwah, not Jesus. Now, chapter 2, <laughs> here we go. As to the coming of our Adon Yeshua HaMashiach and our gathering to him, stop right there, because there's a lot of misunderstanding about these first few sentences here in chapter 2. This first sentence, when he says, As to the coming of our Adon HaMashiach and our gathering together to him, that is talking about the net chetef. No one is gathered to him at the second coming. There are those who are gathered to him at the net chetef. So as to that, we ask you, believers, verse 2, not to become easily unsettled in mind or troubled either by spirit or by word or by letter, as if from us, as if the day of Yahuwah has come. The day of Yahuwah, you'll see in other English versions, the day of the Lord. This is a catchphrase that runs in the first covenant throughout the renewed covenant. It's always a reference to the tribulation, the day of Elohim's wrath, the seven-year tribulation, the 70 weeks of Daniel. However, there in verse 2, he's talking about the tribulation. Verse 1, he's talking about the Nechetef. Verse 2, he's talking about the tribulation. Let's turn a couple of pages over to the right. We want to go to 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18. However, if you're in the Hallelujah Scriptures, the Hallelujah Scriptures is arranged in chronological order of how the books were written in terms of time. Unlike all your other English versions, they're, they're arranged in a different, uh, a different way. You see, in the Hallelujah Scriptures, you have 1 Timothy, then Titus, then 2 Timothy. So, uh, we want to go to 2 Timothy. That's Timotheos. 2 Timothy, uh, chapter 2, verse 18. Let's start with verse 16, where it says, But keep away from profane, empty babblings, for they go on to more wickedness, and their word shall eat its way like gangrene. Humaneus and Philetos are of this sort, who have missed concerning the truth, saying that the resurrection has already taken place, and they overthrow the belief of some. So there were, there were those out there saying that the, uh, the resurrection had already taken place. There were those out there forging writings and saying that the writings were of Shaul, Paul, where he says in verse 2, back to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2, he says, you know, speaking of, you know, words, people talking, or by letter, as if from us. There were letters going around back then saying that they were written by Paul or Timothy or whoever, and they weren't. So he's referring to that here. And those letters or rumors were saying that the tribulation has come. And as we saw in uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 18, there are those saying that the resurrection had already happened. The Netchatef had already happened. Anyway, verse 3. Let no one deceive you in any way, because... The falling away is to come first, and then the, law, the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction, and there's no period he keeps going on. We're going to have to stop there because, verse 3, 
Let no one deceive you in any way because the falling away. Some versions say the rebellion. Prior to the King James Version of the Bible, the scripture here would say, let no one deceive you in any way, because the departure, the departure, they taught the Nechatef back then. They taught the rapture back then. The departure, meaning people leaving. And even here, regardless of what your English version says, in the Greek, the word there for falling away or rebellion, or maybe some might even say apostasy, the Greek word there is apostasia. Now, the root of apostasia is apo, and that Greek word is referring specifically to the departure from the surface of an object. This is why prior to the King James Version, it literally said, the departure. And even here in the Greek, it doesn't mean apostasy. It, it's talking about the departure from the surface of the earth, the netkatef, the harpazo, the rapture. Now, in the Aramaic, which the uh, Renewed Covenant books were written in, we have here the odiote. In the Aramaic here for um, where the falling away, rebellion, apostasy, the departure, the uh, Aramaic here is marod ota, and that is mem, resh, wa, dalit, wa, tau, aleph. Mem represents water or blood. It represents the word, Yeshua. Resh, picture of a man's head, has to do with who your headship is, what your thoughts are. Your thoughts will reflect who your headship is. Wa, we know, is the tent peg. Pitching your tent with Elohim. Dalit is the door. It talks about movement in and out of this door and refers to the four dimensions of space and time. Then we have wa again, the tent peg. And that's followed by tau. This is uh, a mark. It's Yahweh's signature. It has to do with a monument. We talked about this when we covered the Yodiot for the Nechetef. The Nechetef itself will be a monument unto Yahweh for all time. And finally, uh, Aleph, which is being yoked to the Father. So here, where it talks about, uh, you know, other versions saying the falling away, apostasy, whatever, that, that does not fit the Aramaic Marod Ota, but the original Greek, Apo, the departure from the surface of something, that does agree with Marod Ota, because Marod Ota is talking about those who recognize Yeshua are saved by his blood, Mem, those whose headship is Elohim, and their thoughts are on him, and his Malchut, his kingdom, that's Resh, and then those who are pitching their tent with Elohim, Wa. And the door, this is Yeshua. This is the four dimensions of space and time. This is the door of the Nechetef. Look at Chazon, Revelation, chapter 4, right off the very first sentence. Chapter 4, verse 1. After this I looked and saw a door having been opened in the Shamaim. Dalit, that's the door that we will pass through in the Nechetef. Then we have Wa again, those who are pitching their tent. And by the way, the root of this Marod Ota is the word Marod, and we covered that, Mem, Resh, Wa, Dalit. Those 
who are saved by the blood of Yeshua, Mem. Those whose headship is Elohim and their thoughts are on his kingdom, Elohim being their headship, Eresh, and then Wa, those who are pitching their tent with Elohim, and Dalet, the door, those who go through the door. And then we have, you know, in this particular scripture, the, uh, the word there is Marod Ota. So Ota is Wa, the tent peg, pitching your tent with Elohim. Tau, those who have Yahweh's mark on them. And Aleph, those who are yoked to the Father. That's clarifying this phrase, the falling away or the rebellion or the apostasy. Really what it should say there is the departure. That was in the English versions before the King James Version. That, you know, is the best. If you want to correct your Bible, whatever Bible you have, some people don't like to mark their Bibles. You know, you don't worship a book, my friends. You worship the Word itself. And we want the truth of what the Father wrote. And the best thing there would be to mark that and say, let no one deceive you in any way, because the departure is to come first. And then the man of lawlessness is to be revealed, the son of destruction. Now this is going to be repeated here soon over in, uh, in verse 7. He's going to repeat this same idea that the departure is going to come first and then the man of lawlessness will be revealed. That's the Antichrist. Everyone thinks of him as the Antichrist. And him being revealed, that's going to be mentioned again in verse 8. And I'll have something to say about that. But let no one deceive you in any way, verse 3, because the departure is going to come first. And the man of lawlessness is to be revealed. In verses 7 and 8, we're going to see that it clarifies, saying that the departure is going to come first, and then, and then, the man of lawlessness will be revealed. The son of destruction who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim or that is worshipped, so that he sits as Elohim in the Mishkan of Elohim, the temple, showing himself that he is Elohim. Now, note verse 4. He opposes and exalts himself above all that is called Elohim. He will be against all forms of worship, not just the word, all forms of worship. Now, this makes sense if you consider that the Antichrist will be of Islam, because Islam is all about everyone on earth must recognize and say, there is no God but Allah, and Muhammad is his messenger. I'm going to put a link here. Here's a picture of Walid Shuabat. It's a good friend of mine. We talk occasionally. He's learned from me. I've certainly learned from him. And this link will take you to an hour-long video. If you click it, it will pause this video. That's okay. And uh, it'll open up a new window. And if you want to take some time, you can watch Walid's video about how the Antichrist does not come out of Rome, he does not come out of the European Union, he comes out of Islam. And he, he backs it up with scripture like no one else ever has. I encourage you to watch Walid's teaching and make notes on it and know that if you've watched my playlist where I cover the whole book of Revelation, I am inserting between the videos that cover chapters 17 and 18 this link to Walid because I used to, I used to be one of those, as there are many for many years taught that, you know, the Antichrist would come out of Rome and the European Union would be that one world government, yada yada. I no longer hold to that. I now believe the Antichrist will come out of Is Islam. And uh, when you watch Walid's video, you'll see what I'm 
you'll see why I agree with him. It's it's in the word, my friends. It's very plain and uh, simple, very clear. So uh, where were we here? He puts himself above all, not just the word. Every religion on earth, he puts himself above all of those. And that's Islam. They want everyone to become Islamic or be executed, beheaded, period. And that ties in with how, I mean, we, we see here that the Antichrist thinks that way. That's Islamic thinking. Verse 5, do you not remember that I told you this while I was still with you? And now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in his time. Verse 7, for the secret of lawlessness is already at work only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. That's uh, Hallelujah Scripture's words this one a little bit unclear, if you ask me. Verse 6, now you know what restrains for him to be revealed in his time. Verse 6 is saying that the Ruach is restraining evil so that the lawless one, we commonly call the Antichrist, not, not proper because Antichrist is a state of mind. Anyone who says that Yahshua is not the son of Yahweh is Antichrist. And again, that points at Islam. Islam says that Allah has no son. Therefore, they believe that Yeshua is not the son of the Father because they think the Father is Allah. And as Walid points out, they say his name is Allah. And you, you say to them, what does Allah mean? And they go, oh, that just means God. Say, well, okay, then I'll say there is no God but God. No, no, you have to say there is no God but Allah. So, you know, deception is going on. At any rate, verse 6 is saying, now you know what restrains for the lawless one to be revealed in his time. Verse 7, the secret of lawlessness is already at work until he who restrains is taken. Hallelujah scripture says, only until he who now restrains comes out of the midst. Other versions we see, until who, he who restrains is taken. I did a study on this a while back. The uh, Greek word there for taken. I saw, you know, he's taken. That sounds like the netchatev. So I looked up in the Greek, and the Greek word there for taken is genomahi. And this was a huge revelation for me because genomahi means thundered, awakened. Think of the netchatev, the rapture. Thundered, awakened, vanished, altered. The corruptible must put on incorruptible. We see in the Corinthians. That's altered. And assembled. We, together we'll meet him in the clouds, in the air. But here's, <laughs> here's the one that really knocked me out of my seat. Gnome, he has to do with being married. This is the bride meeting the groom. This is the Nechatef, the Ruach, is indwelling those who are true believers, those who are truly pitching their tent with Elohim. And the Ruach is restraining evil until he's taken, Nechatef. When the Nechatef happens, those who have the indwelling Ruach are taken up. The Ruach leaves the earth, and then evil is no longer restrained. You and I have no idea what that truly means. For evil not to be restrained, it's going to get crazy on this earth. Now, how do we know that it's the Ruach who restrains evil? Look at Genesis chapter 6, verse 3. It tells us that the Ruach contends with sin. Look at Yochanan, John, chapter 14, verses 16 and 17. 
clearly says that the Ruach operates through us. And we are taken, the Ruach is taken. The Ruach's job is done. He came to the earth to gather those chosen by Yahweh as a gift for his son. And at the Nechatef, that gift is delivered and the Ruach leaves the earth. We all go back to the Shamayim with the Ruach. And then things get crazy. Look at verse 7 again. For the secret of lawlessness is already at work until he who restrains it is taken. At the Nechatef. Verse 8, and then the lawless one shall be revealed, whom the Adon shall consume with the Ruach of his mouth and bring to naught with the manifestation of his coming, second coming, seven years later or more. This word here revealed says the lawless one will be revealed the greek word there is apocalypto it means unveiled to the mind or the senses so in other words right now the lawless one is veiled to many people's minds and senses they don't realize Many don't realize that they're holding hands and pitching their tent with the lawless one. We're going to stop here. Next week, we'll do a little bit of a recap, pick up where we left off, and continue. As always, I hope and I pray, my friends, that this video has been a beracha to you and yours. Thank you for being here and sharing this with me. Shalom, my friends. Let your kingdom come. Oh, oh, oh. It's an ancient story that still gets told To those who hear and those who don't By prophets and trees and things out of the